So I think uh, we can start now. Um, everybody again, um, we're really pleased to invite you uh, to the Herbal Data Community's monthly virtual meetup. So this gathering serves as an opportunity to foster local and international connections with individuals of similar interests with the field of uh, data science and AI. So uh, all our discussions, uh, they would cover the fundamentals of data science and AI, and as well as other important trends, researches, higher studies, and job opportunities. And um, yeah, additionally, the attendees, uh, you will also have uh, the opportunity to gain exposure to renowned researchers and industry leaders. Um, and we also have uh, two guests uh, with us today. Uh, I would like to say a little bit, uh, a few words about myself first. I am Tanzim Hawk. I am the lead for STEM outreach at Harwell. My background is I am a data engineer. I studied bioinformatics from Technical University of Munich and LMU, University of Munich. So I'm based in Germany, as I'm saying Munich that much. I've been uh, working as a data engineer for, I think, seven years now. I, I was also working as a teaching assistant at the Technical University of Munich. So um, currently I am uh, working as a senior data engineer in the healthcare uh, area in Germany with a focus to digitalize the hospitals and healthcare system in Germany. So um, we also have our How Will team present here. We have Dr. Reha Barama. She is a, a physician. She is based in Bangladesh. We have Tahia Islam. She is working for uh, as a teacher for Teach for Bangladesh. She is also based in Bangladesh. We have Human Kabir. He is everything. He has got everything to do with our technical stuff, our technical support. Uh, he is currently in Moscow. We have uh, Zareen Haidar. She is also in Bangladesh. And Tasneem, she is uh, also from our data science and data community team. She's in Bangladesh. And well, last but not least, we have Farhana Hassan, the CEO and founder of Her Will. So I would just as like to say a few words about our guests and uh, then we will uh, start with our discussions. So um, we have uh, Dr. Alper Atamturk here. It's a great honor for us to have you today with us. So he is a professor and department chair of Department of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at University of California, Berkeley. We also have as our featured student, Arnoli Moinuddin, she is doing her master's at Georgia Institute of Technology, and she is going to start her internship at Apple from next week. So without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, give it over to Farhana. Farhana, how are you doing today? Thank you so much, Tanzim. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here today. What we're trying to do is build a global data community to share knowledge between uh, across borders. And I am so glad to see that we have so many participants from many different parts of the world. We actually miss Sanjida, who's in our team, who's joining us from Helsinki. So you all know about her will pretty much. And if you have any additional questions, please let us know. At the end, we can answer those. But I would like to go um, uh, jump in right into the program today because we have a very a tight uh, event planned for you. We are so honored and privileged to have Dr. Alper Atantorg with us, um, who has a, a very illustrious bio that you may have gone over. So I will not um, go over that any longer. But um, just, just know this, he is one of the pioneers and one of the major researchers um, and intellectuals and scholars of our time, and we are really privileged to have him with us. So please utilize this time. It's going to be, uh, today we have a little different format. 
Um, we're going to ask Dr. Atam to talk to us for a couple of minutes, and then we'll ask him a series of questions, some questions that you've already submitted, and some questions that I thought that would be beneficial for all, all of you. So we will start with Dr. Atam Turk, and then um, the importance of professional skills. I hate to call it the soft skills, but you know this is what the industry know, uh, know them as. So we kept it as soft skills, but my um, our plan is to get you all familiarized with the term professional skills and get away from soft skills because these are critical success factors for whatever we do in our careers and leadership. So it's very important for us to write it, uh, to call them in their right phrase. So um, Arnaby Mounudian from Georgia Tech, who is going to take a couple of semesters off to work at Apple and moving to California next week, is going to talk to us about interview skills and how what kind of preparation goes on each of the interviews she has faced in uh, faced in her uh, career journey so far. So she will go over those. And with that, I would love to um, also at the end of the program, Tanzim is going to go and share uh, some some exciting opportunities with us. Um, some few fun games and award opportunities uh, that will really motivate the community, I hope. And also if you have any other questions and ways to involve more with us, please let us know. So with that, I would ask Dr. Adam Dork to come on and say a few words. Hello, good morning, Professor. Uh, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining from. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Farhana, for uh, the kind invitation, and um, I'm delighted uh, to uh, be part of uh, this community and have an opportunity to uh, represent uh, UC Berkeley uh, and National Engineering Operations Research Department and 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 uh, you know, talk uh, to her real uh, participants uh, sort of some of the opportunities. Um, uh, uh, we have at uh, UC, and um, uh, yeah, and 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 happy to answer uh, any uh, questions. Um, um, so I have a few uh, slides that I'd like to sort of start with to, to set the stage. Uh, so to tell you, um, so what we do. Uh, I I think uh, those slides will be helpful. Um, um, for 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 the for this audience, um, but before I start, uh, is there any sort of a specific uh, sort of question? Um, we do have some specific questions, but we will let you go first, okay. and, and then go through the Q and A process. Sure. So, uh, all right. So, let me try to share my screen. Um, this is a PDF file. Are you able to see it? Yes, we can see yes. it. Okay, let me uh, maximize it. Great. So I just wanted to, uh, I have a few slides to give an overview of uh, of my department. I am um, the chair of um, UC Berkeley's Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department. And uh, we participate in uh, a number of activities um, uh, with sort of Parhana as well as part of the AI Institute. I'm going to mention uh, uh, that. And, and uh, we have some other programs that uh, may be of quite interest uh, to her real uh, participants. So uh, first, let me say with where we are. So we are uh, located in uh, Berkeley, uh, San Francisco Bay Area which is really the world hub of um, innovation, in high tech, you know, data analytics, and healthcare and design. Uh, we are so fortunate uh, to have a, a beautiful campus overlooking at the Bay Area. And you see here in this picture on the left, the uh, Berkeley uh, campus, Campanella, and uh, uh, up in the sort of horizon, the city of San Francisco across uh, the, the Bay. And um, also, we are so fortunate to be surrounded mm -hmm. by an ecosystem of innovative 
companies, uh, um, I'm, I've listed a number of them. So here, I'm sure uh, you're familiar with, with uh, most of these. And uh, we are so used to uh, relying on their sort of products and services uh, nowadays. And, uh, and um, they, many of them are you know, started by UC Berkeley alumni and uh, our students work um, in uh, these companies, either they do internships or, or uh, they have full-time uh, jobs. Um, um, so it is really a sort of very a sort of unique uh, place uh, to, to, to be, um, highly innovative. Um, and uh, you know, we, there's a lot of transfer of technology into these companies. And also we learn from these companies about the, about the next generation of problems uh, that, that we need to investigate. Uh, so the quick overview of the sort of the timeline of our sort of department, industrial engineering uh, department uh, was a division of mechanical engineering in, 90, in, in 50s and it has become a department of its own. And we added operations research in 66. And uh, in 2006, uh, we started offering an operations research and management science uh, degree for not in the College of Engineering, but in the College of Letters and Sciences. And that has been a very uh, successful program attracting students with a diverse uh, uh, set of backgrounds, not just engineering students, but uh, students coming from uh, all sorts of letters and science programs. Um, and uh, in 2010, uh, we introduced a new Master of Engineering program uh, that is designed to um, raise uh, leaders in engineering and a program that focuses on sort of technical engineering skills as well as entrepreneurship leadership. Um, uh, so sort of a similar to a sort of a mix of a business and engineering program. And uh, finally, uh, just this last, last fall, we started our first Master of Analytics uh, 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 program and the first cohort started in the fall semester. And, and this program in particular might be very much of an interest uh, to uh, her real uh, participants. Um, the, our department has two names, Industrial Engineering Operations Research, or OR Operations Research, uh, really combines the methodologies such as optimization, statistics, and uh, modeling uncertainty. And that's the sort of theoretical underpinnings of the area. And industrial engineering refers to utilization of these analytical methods uh, in a number of industrial scale systems, whether this is a healthcare system or energy system, transportation system, or financial system. Uh, we care about uh, efficient uh, use of you know, resources, whether it's, you know, data, value, uh, sort of information, materials. And, um, and so that is the more of an applied uh, side of the field. But these two areas are sort of highly interconnected with each other. In terms of sort of research areas focused uh, by fact that are done in the department by faculty and uh, students, their students, on the foundations, um, we have, uh, I think, say that we, we have a strong group in optimization algorithms and stochastic and simulation. And, uh, and more recently in the last decade or so, a growing uh, data science and analytics uh, group. And uh, we focus on a number of uh, industries um, and, and they include energy, healthcare, uh, manufacturing and finance um, um, as well. And, and I think nothing says uh, better than what we do than uh, looking at where our students uh, go to, where our graduates alumni uh, sort of go to. Um, you see in this list that our graduates uh, pretty much contribute to every sector of the economy, whether it is an e-commerce or you know, IT, you know, healthcare, uh, entertainment, telecommunication, and uh, a number of sort of uh, big companies are listed uh, in, in parentheses, but for each of uh, these well-known companies, there are probably 50 or so startups that are you know, trying different ideas, trying to create different products and services. 
and uh, many of our students go to, into those uh, startups uh, as well. Uh, our rankings, um, um, the university, UC, UC Berkeley is ranked as number one uh, uh, public uh, university. And we are fortunate to be in a college uh, uh, of, of number three uh, college of engineering in the US and our graduate program is uh, rated number two by US News and World Report uh, immediately after uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the AI Institute. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a collaborative um, uh, program um, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and it's a collaboration uh, of a number of universities. Uh, Georgia Tech is the lead institution and uh, followed by Berkeley, uh, USC, and contributions from the Clark Atlanta University and um, UT uh, Arlington. Uh, from the UC Berkeley side, uh, we have a number of interdisciplinary faculty working on different areas um, and they're listed uh, here, whether it's combinatorial uh, sort of learning, uh, new uh, methods for optimization sort of solvers and, and deployment of these uh, methodological uh, developments in a number of end use cases, such as energy systems, uh, chip design, logistics and uh, supply chains. And I'm happy to talk more about uh, uh, this collaboration uh, in the Q&A uh, session. And I, and I want to finish with uh, this new program that we started, uh, the, the analytics program. Um, this is from a recent study, well, 2017, not so recent anymore, uh, but uh, done by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, they looked at the sort of job postings uh, in the data science and analytics uh, area and uh, observed that the breakup was uh, sort of two to one. So there are twice as many analytics jobs than, than data science uh, out there. Uh, so what does that mean is, is uh, that, you know, uh, uh, with the advances in data science, it has become uh, rather uh, you know, cheap and ubiquitous to collect and store uh, massive amounts of data. And, and uh, we are able to you know, manage and analyze data rather easily with all the sort of tools that are developed in, in this field. So really the next step forward is how to translate this massive amount of data into smart decisions to create new you know, services, to improve those services uh, uh, and, and products. And that is what analytics is all about. So taking that data and translating them into sort of smart decisions. And uh, pretty much every sector of the economy needs analytics professionals, whether it is, you know, healthcare. So uh, um, Tanzim mentioned uh, that, that, that she is in the healthcare area. And uh, that is uh, very, very important. Uh, so being able to better utilize uh, uh, leverage the data um, in healthcare, whether it's uh, the energy sector, the transportation, whether it's finance. Um, uh, there are uh, a lot more opportunities now opening up in uh, many traditional industries uh, to be able to better uh, deploy and, and leverage the, the wealth of data. And this degree program sort of aims to uh, train professionals that can bridge the gap between data scientists and, and product managers. So we're looking to train um, uh, professionals who can you know, speak the language of data science who are very uh, 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 proficient with data and, and uh, but also understand so they not only learn the tools, data tools, but can uh, are trained in a number of uh, industry uh, sort of domains so that they can ask the right set of questions and, and they can make the sort of right decisions to how to best uh, utilize uh, data in those areas. So on the left, you see the core courses, sort of these are 
you know, such as Python, databases, and machine learning uh, uh, courses. Whereas on the sort of right, you see the elective courses in uh, a number of sort of different sort of domain areas, whether it's energy, finance, and supply chains, and healthcare. Okay. So uh, we started this program, and um, the first cohort uh, um, uh, started in the fall, um, and uh, we were very pleased with the you know, demand that we've seen for the program. And you see here a, demo, a little bit of a um, demographics. I'm ha so happy to say that 55 of percent of the students are are uh, female. And uh, we uh, have students from all around the world. And um, you see the geographic representation in the center on the, on the right, uh, sort of some of the schools uh, they are coming from. And they are coming from really uh, with diverse backgrounds, uh, with, with um, bachelor's degrees in you know, math, statistics, economics, data science, business, um, uh, really, uh, but I think one third of uh, but engineers, but the rest is. Um, uh, uh, bring diverse experiences. And um, so I'm very pleased uh, with that. So I'm going to end uh, with this slide and open up uh, for your questions. Thanks so much, Professor Atamtur. That was really, um, that's going to be beneficial for uh, everyone because a lot of times we get asked the question, how is industrial and system engineering um, related to data science and AI? As you know, that we evangelize and making data science and AI accessible to the underrepresented communities around the world. So it's um, that question you answered, but if you have a little bit more to add to that, that would be beneficial, that how data analytics and data science directly help the industrial engineers in operation research and optimization. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. So uh, many of our students nowadays find jobs. So if you look at their titles, they're, uh, they're, they're finding jobs as machine learning analysts, uh, not so much as industrial engineers, uh, because we give them the tools uh, such as you know, data tools, uh, databases, uh, the machine learning and, and uh, optimization and stochastics, uh, they can really utilize these tools and uh, with the, in, independent of the area that they uh, work in and ask the right set of questions and uh, being able to sort of utilize them. So we not only sort of teach them the data tools, but, but um, domain uh, specific uh, knowledge as, as well. So I think that, that differentiates industrial engineering uh, from let's say a traditional um, or data science program or a computer science program where the focus is on, on the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, we pay a lot of attention how, I mean, you would see that in, in our courses as well. Um, we would have a lot of projects in these courses where students uh, deploy these various techniques that they, they learn in, uh, in a number of uh, various sort of applied sort of air projects in different, air, different areas. Um, and that really adds a lot of resilience to our degree as, as well. I found uh, alumni you know, easily transitioning from one field to another field uh, uh, and you know, uh, translating the knowledge that, that they have gained uh, into a different uh, field uh, rather so sort of easily. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, that is our number one question we usually get asked. So I hope that will clarify it going forward. And so let me switch gear just a little bit. Um, what we would love to hear from you is your life and career journey a little bit. Because as you can see around the room, most of us are people of color, actually 100% of us are, either um, immigrants uh, at their you know, current resident or, or to be immigrants somewhere in the future. So if you would let us know about that part of your career in life, how that affected you and got you where you are today, 
uh, I think would that would be really beneficial for all. Sure, I'm happy to say a few uh, words, but I'd rather this to be an opportunity to, uh, for 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 the audience rather than focus on on, on me and and uh, um, so um, I am an immigrant as well to to the United States. Uh, I uh, you know I grew up in in Turkey and um, I did my uh, undergraduate studies there and and came to United States uh, to do my doctoral studies and actually studied at Georgia Tech. Uh, is where I got my uh, doctoral degree, and and then um, got my job as, as as a faculty member at UC Berkeley after uh, you know, finishing my studies at uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, and and joined the department. So that is my sort of uh, sort of short sort of journey. Uh, uh, but it was uh, really uh, the the opportunity to study. Uh, at Georgia Tech, with uh, with uh, you know my, my advisors who who is uh, a you know, very well known uh, person in in our field. I was uh, very fortunate to be given uh, the opportunity with full scholarship uh, to 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 work with him, and um, and I try to use that opportunity as much as I can and make the best of it. And um, um, I feel um, 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 like, and this is a cliche, but United States of America is really a land of opportunities. Uh, if you're, if you have the drive interest, um, 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 really, there are really, uh, I feel no sort of uh, barriers. It's always a struggle. It's always a struggle to uh, you know move from one country to another country, and uh, there's there's some learning curve. Um, um, there are certain sort of handicaps. Language can be a barrier. Um, uh, one may have to work a little harder, uh, but it is it is um, um, certainly uh, possible. And and I I hope uh, many in this audience. Um, uh, do apply to universities in, in, in the United States, whether it's Georgia Tech, whether it's uh, Berkeley UC, uh, or, or, or USC, and uh, get such opportunities similar to ones that I have had. And uh, we do offer scholarships to international students uh, uh, as, as well. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so happy that you are participating and learning about these opportunities through Herville. That's great. Um, so a related question, how would you motivate um, some students who are currently pursuing their graduate degrees in getting their master's or finishing up their undergrad um, to participate and uh, doing their doctorate? Because, you know, it's a it's PhD is all about contributing in the field of studies, contributing a piece of knowledge and to expand that knowledge base. So uh, we would hope a lot of uh, students do get motivated. And how would you inspire us? Yeah, uh, great, great question. So I, I mean, I'm looking at this this audience. Uh, I also see I mean, um, a sort of diverse sort of background. We definitely uh, would like to attract. Uh, one thing I want to say is that um, I'm thrilled that uh, in our department. Um, uh, the majority of the students at this point are are uh, sort of women or identify as women, and and uh, except for our PhD program, right? Uh, so our undergraduate and master's programs are majority women, uh, and uh, uh, our PhD program, I think we are uh, about forty percent. Um, uh, it is still a, a large percentage compared to uh, sort of other engineering fields. Uh, for a sort of STEM engineering uh, field, it is. Uh, 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 very good, but obviously uh, we'll, we're very much interested in reaching parity uh, there in our PhD programs as well. Um, so uh, PhD, as Farhana, you, you mentioned, it is about creating new knowledge. Um, and uh, it is the focus <laughs> in PhD is uh, less on you know, learning uh, what has been done in the past, 
taking courses. There's obviously some course taking as well, uh, uh, but uh, the, the focus is mainly on uh, creating new knowledge, right? Doing doing research uh, with uh, with a professor or with a group of professors in, in a particular area, going very deep into that area and and discovering something new, and then uh, you know, making that known to the world by publishing the research papers. And uh, hopefully, uh, that new knowledge then is utilized. Uh, that fundamental research goes into uh, many uh, sort of domains and ap applications. Um, it is it is something I think really exciting uh, to be able to pursue, uh, uh, given the time uh, for it. A lot of time. So uh, PhD takes four to five years. Um, whereas a master's program may be finished in a year, in a year and a half. Uh, so there's more time allowed uh, for it. So one needs uh, you know, space and time to be able to do that and also financial resources to be able to do that, right? So we do offer uh, full financial support uh, to our PhD students. Uh, uh, in the first year, uh, they receive a, you know, a fellowship. Um, where their you know, tuition and all the fees and, and you know, health insurance, et cetera, are fully covered and they do get stipends uh, as well. Um, and then after the first year, uh, they either become a research assistant, work with uh, a professor under a research uh, program, uh, such as the one that we have, for instance, with the AI Institute, or they become mm -hmm. uh, teaching assistants and, and help um, the, the faculty teach courses and, and employed uh, that way to you know, cover the cost of sort of education that, that, that they are getting uh, a, a, as well. Um, so it, it, is, it is important, unlike a sort of master's program, um, uh, to you know, support this effort, we do provide uh, sort of full financial assistance to, to our PhD students as, as well. And this is common. Uh, uh, pretty much throughout uh, the uh, institutions uh, across across the world, um, it is really exciting. Um, uh, I, I in the the first year, at least at Berkeley, is sort of a discovery year so when students come in. Uh, so if they have a master's degree, they may have an idea of what they want to uh, work on. But uh, sometimes they come directly from an undergraduate program, and um, they may not quite know which area they want, they want to research. And they utilize uh, that uh, first year um, that comes with a fellowship to explore um, and by taking different courses in different areas, by you know, speaking to different professors and sitting in their uh, research meetings uh, and seminars. Um, they try to explore what areas they may like, they may not like, and and then after the first year, engage, start engaging in a particular uh, research uh, area. I'm not sure if I answered sort of your, your question. No. Um, you you know. did it perfectly. Uh, and I really hope it's encouraging for all, and we would love all of you to pursue the highest degree possible in any of your fields of choices, because you know only then you're going to make the contribution as you need for. Um, and for the and let, let me finish this yeah. up. So after finishing a PhD, there are really multiple uh, paths, uh, career uh, paths. You know, the, the classical one would be uh, becoming a, a faculty member, professor, at some university like like me, myself, and uh, and and that is uh, great. Many of our students are. Uh, we are known, UC Berkeley is known to uh, you know, create new uh, generations of professors and uh, our students are employed in uh, universities throughout the world. Um, uh, but also uh, one can work in industry as well. So that's also uh, an, an avenue. Uh, but I think about half of our students go to industry, half of them go to academia. And um, there are, you know, very interesting job opportunities for people with uh, PhDs uh, as well. Um, uh, they tend to be more research uh, positions, uh, more applied research um, towards perhaps a, a product in, in a company. 
um, um, and and uh, one may find uh, it to be uh, more um, sort of interesting in the sense that um, there is uh, when one has a sort of PhD, uh, there is a little more freedom uh, a given, and one may be actually perhaps you know, running a sort of a research team uh, sort of over, over time, and uh, I think even sort of industry job tends to be more sort of interesting and and uh, because there's always some some exploration of uh, 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 you know, raising questions and trying to answer those questions uh, as well. But if it, even if it's industry job with, with a PhD degree. Perfect. Um... We are, I'm going to take a break and go to some of the student questions we now have. So the first person has actually applied to one of your programs. So she has some additional questions that I would love for her to go ask. Tasneem. Hello, Professor. So I am currently okay. studying uh, in Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, and I have few months uh, until I finish my undergrad. So uh, I had a question. Uh, since you have mentioned the total research processes uh, in PhD, uh, so uh, in most of the cases, what happens is, uh, say, when we start our research, we have a goal in mind that uh, we need uh, this percentage of optimization or this percentage of accuracy in machine learning, right? And then uh, at the course of time, we don't reach it. And then uh, sometimes we also see some uh, stru well-structured papers where uh, they actually mention that uh, why we have failed the procedure, we can't uh, reach the goal. But uh, actually what uh, we as a student mostly struggle is uh, when is the perfect time to say that, okay, this has not worked the way we like, and then actually go for the publication? Uh, that is actually a very good question. Uh, and um, often um, uh, that comes with, 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 with time and experience to be able to, uh, in, in research uh, especially, we uh, often, um, I often sort of, uh, it, 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 to me, it, it feels like um, your eyes close and trying to find your way in, in the room, uh, in, in, in the dark, and you're trying to sort of feel it, uh, because it's often, you don't really see too far in advance, it's, it's unknown, uh, you can only see uh, very close uh, to you what you can sort of uh, feel, and you make a decision, take a path, and often we reach a roadblock, most of the time. Uh, most of research is about failing, and but we learn from those failures, right? And we always sort of, we, we try to attempt uh, to get to a successful outcome, but often the path that we choose uh, may end up with a sort of a dead end, and then we need to uh, backtrack and find a more uh, uh, suitable, convenient uh, path. But we important thing is learning from that failure, right? And that is that is part of the process. So every time we make a sort of failure, we learn from from it, and it's it's good. I mean, it is we need to take risk. If we don't take risk, you will not. Uh, create new knowledge. Uh, so it is very important to be able to take those uh, risks. And um, that's where the sort of PhD sort of supervisor uh, comes into the picture. If you have an experienced supervisor, uh, depending on the experience of also the student, uh, uh, the supervisor may lead you into sort of paths where uh, you, you know, hopefully to discover something new, but also if you don't, you learn um, something meaningful from that experience and then utilize it and somewhere else, right? In another direction. Um, 
that that is uh, that is a great question, um, but that is part of the uh, research process, um, being able to make mistakes and learn from those uh, mistakes and backtrack and then um, find a new path. Okay. Uh, another question from Akia. Mm, hello, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so I have several questions regarding Masters of Analytics in UC Berkeley. So um, I've heard that uh, if I have job experience, it increases my chance to uh, getting admitted. So, uh, but I do not have any work experience. I'm currently an undergraduate student, uh, but I have uh, experience, uh, business experience. I have a handicraft business. So does that increase my chance for getting admitted? Uh, and that's one question. And um, I have another question that is uh, how to avail the scholarships and how to increase my chance to get the scholarships. And I have another question that is, uh, do you think data analytics have an upper hand than data science masters in general? Okay. So I have three questions. Okay. <laughs> that's all. Uh, so uh, let me start with the uh, the, the first one, uh, the um, uh, whether work experience uh, increases the, ch the chance. Uh, well, if, if you look at our current cohort, a large majority of our students don't have work experience. Um, and uh, so it is perfectly fine not to have work experience. This is not an MBA program. In MBA programs, uh, uh, it is uh, often a requirement to have had a, a few years of uh, job experience. Uh, that is not the case uh, for us. Uh, if you do have a relevant work experience, it, you can definitely uh, it strengthen your application, right? And so uh, it is possible that you work in an area and then you, you, you know, identified uh, that you need some additional skills uh, and uh, that hopefully motivates you to, and, uh, to study in a particular area. So that is always useful, but it is definitely not a requirement. and um, I always emphasize that we like to have a cohort, a diverse cohort of uh, people coming from different uh, experiences, whether it's work experience or academic experience from different fields, because there's a lot of learning that happens, peer-to-peer -peer learning, right? Not all learning is in class through lectures, but students uh, do you know, projects together in teams and they learn from each other. And um, so those sort of different experiences and backgrounds um, uh, you know, help everyone in, in, in the in the cohort. Um, so I hope uh, that answered that question. Um, uh, yes. So you, you shouldn't feel disadvantaged if you don't have the, the, the work experience. Um, and the second one was uh, whether a scholar, uh, scholarship would, scholarship or what increases my chance to uh, get scholarship. What increases your chance to get a scholarship? Uh, interesting question. Um, so we definitely uh, pay attention to the financial needs of the students. And, and uh, there is a section in the application uh, about the financial needs. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, the program is, you know, affordable and uh, the students, those who are really qualified and, and can attend the program. Um, uh, so it is it is hard for me to sort of uh, give you a sort of a formula, a sort of blanket formula. It's really very much sort of case by case basis. And there's a committee that uh, goes uh, through the applicants as uh, sort of needs uh, very carefully. And, and that committee makes a, a sort of decision um, um, but but it, it is you know definitely provided uh, you know we provide financial aid to international uh, students uh, as as well. And um, your Thank you. final uh, question. Yes, my third question was uh, that: Do you think that uh, data analytics have an upper hand than data science masters in general? Um, that is my personal view. Um, it uh, with with the with an analytics degree, that analytics degree, you uh, 
learn skills how to deploy um, the data tools into sort of a different various areas, right? So that um, that aspect translating data to decisions uh, that is uh, the really the definition of sort of an analytics and deploying in different areas uh, that gives, in my opinion, an edge to the analytics students. Uh, of course, they need to understand. Uh, so our students take uh, a Python uh, bootcamp, for instance, right? So they need to be very familiar with databases, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, very fluent with data, large scale using large scale data, but um that is that there are so many people with those skills and and you know going beyond that beyond that uh, sort of basic data skills and uh having experience of learning how to deploy the data into making uh smart decisions uh i believe gives uh, more of an edge, and especially if you can specialize in a particular industry um, uh, during your studies, whether it is the finance industry, whether it's a supply chain industry, uh, that is an additional sort of specialization. Um, in my opinion, that sort of separates uh, uh, you as an individual uh, from the rest of, of the applicants when you're applying for jobs. And also, you've seen the statistics is that uh, there are more jobs in analytics than, than data science. Uh, Thank you. This was helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the student side? If not, I have a couple of questions that we gathered from the students and also came up with that ourselves. One of the questions is, we are an inflection point for all things data science and AI. Um, you know, it can go either way, you know, destruct the world, destroy everything we as we know it, or massively improve our quality of life, life and, um, you know, the way we work and create new jobs, new opportunities for us, right? Being an expert in the field from the inside, what is your personal view of this whole phenomenon that, that we're going through? Um, it's it's really interesting. So it's, it's definitely um, like many um, major technology. It's a disruptive technology, right? It is AI it is disrupting um, uh, many industries and and the way we do things, and uh, and creating uh, new areas, uh, creating new opportunities and and jobs and you know opening up new avenues uh for us um for the world um so number one i think we really need to pay a lot of attention into ethics uh in in our research in our dealings uh and how we deploy uh these technologies and uh, that is a, a number one priority in the AI Institute that, that I'm a part of. Uh, every research project is reviewed by an ethics uh, committee. And uh, we always ask uh, the implications, uh, ethical implications of our work. Um, we raise those kind of questions uh, while we're doing the research. Sometimes this is obvious and sometimes it is not obvious. Uh, and one has to think sort of a few steps down the line is what might happen. And, and we, we try to you know, identify those issues uh, in advance and, and, um, and address them. Um, so I think that is, uh, that, that is important. Um, and I would say the second important thing is that uh, this is happening right uh whether whether we like it or don't like it we agree or not agree it uh, uh, the technology will continue to advance um, 
you, you must you probably have heard about the 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 the, the chat uh, uh, that's been in the news uh, where students are writing their sort of essays now uh, through uh, this uh, chat program. Um, and, and we can react to it in a different number of different ways and try to sort of illuminate, uh, prevent it, or use it, um, understand it, and make the best uh, use, of, uh, use of it. Um, I think to be successful in this new world and in the world that sort of our children and, and you will also uh, be, be going into, uh, we have to understand these technologies. And, uh, and the best way to do it is uh, getting the education, uh, which, which you are doing. So I admire you for, for, for doing it and, and, uh, and uh, you know, understanding the, the, the nuances and the pros and cons of uh, them and, and the, the balances. And uh, ultimately, the decisions are made by sort of humans, right? Whether to deploy a particular technology in a, in a particular way. And uh, we can all be part of that conversation. And, uh, and the more diverse opinions that we have, in making those decisions, I think the uh, more uh, powerful, positive those outcomes are going to be, uh, and uh, we so we can ensure that we don't um, miss out a particular sort of concern, uh, a particular demographics in and making these decisions, and uh, so I think. Again, incorporating a sort of uh, building a diverse workforce in AI, I think is going to be you know, particularly important uh, when we have these sort of conversations about sort of ethical deployment of AI technologies. And, and, and I applaud you, uh, uh, Hannah, for uh, in, in your uh, the tremendous efforts in this direction. Thanks so much. Uh, a fun fact I, I should share with you right now. It about just before our program, I was playing with Chat GPT and I wrote, um, give me the best questions to interview Dr. Alper Atamtorg. And I asked another question, give me the best questions to ask on an interview for a professor at Berkeley in industrial and system engineering. So you would be amazed the similarities of the questions that it gave it, it generated for me. So it was right on point. It, it immediately recognized you. Of course, you were uh, all over the internet and, and had your data and presented me with a very reasonable set of questions. So well, I should have used it myself and, and, and <laughs> you're gonna have prepared so much answers fun. for those questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, it's actually different from um what i was thought uh, i was gonna ask but there's some couple of things that really piqued my interest so i wanted to share that fun fact with you it is it is a fun place you can uh, lose yourself playing with it it's it does a lot of things <laughs> okay so the last question um respecting everyone's time we do allocate 90 minutes for these meetings um last question we have is I mean, really, we can't thank you enough for being here, but we really wanted to know, um, since my inter interaction started with you at, at the Institute at Georgia Tech, um, what your opinion of, of her will is and how do you envision um, and a long-term interdisciplinary uh, relationship with her will, collaboration, this partnership, and continuous involvement with her will. Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I I think her will is an amazing organization. Uh, you know, creating uh, some opportunities for sort of women and um, uh, in the AI world, um, in the data science world, uh, creating new sort of pathways, and uh, not just within the United States, but internationally. Uh, uh, right, and as I mentioned sort of earlier, um, we need diverse experiences. We need diverse opinions uh, to 
create a creative in, environment, right? Research is all about uh, being creativity and creativity is fostered by, by uh, a diverse uh, set of experiences, opinions, and, 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 uh, and cultures. So uh, in, in that sense, um, I, her wills us uh, connection to the AI Institute, to Georgia Tech and Berkeley, uh, I think is going to be uh, you know, very helpful. And I'm really looking forward uh, to receive a large number of applications uh, from her will participants uh, into our you know, not only research programs through the AI Institute, but also our education uh, programs as, as well. Um, uh, I really like to sort of leverage uh, this partnership to diversify uh, our, our communities and uh, our sort of programs. Um, and I'm really looking forward to you know, these types of uh, sessions and visits. Uh, uh, we're, we're more than happy to uh, you know, arrange visits to California, uh, 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 your, your students, participants, and uh, do workshops, um, uh, trainings, um, uh, whether it's virtual or 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 in in, in person as well, uh, when when it's suitable, maybe over over summer over the summertime. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm 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 open to all uh, types of uh, collaboration uh, with with her will. Um, as as UC Berkeley, part of UC Berkeley, also as part of the AI Institute. Thank you so much, Professor Atom Torek. It, um, very, very humbling, this whole experience and our interaction with you, our collaboration with you, and for you uh, to be here and give us all your insight. And we're really looking forward to all of our participants and all of our community members to uh, explore the field of data science and AI and industrial system engineering. Um, and we would, with that, uh, we end this part of our um, program. And if I would love to uh, relate the torch to Tahia, if you have something going on. Thank you so much. Um, I was, um, I'm Tahia, I'm one of the leads from Harwell, and I was really very mesmerizing, really listening to the whole uh, discussion that you were hitting. Uh, I'm not from this field, so a lot of things was new for me, but I really enjoyed and I really tried to understand the uh, extreme opportunities that data science has. Um, having said that, I would really request everyone present in today's meeting to turn on their video and uh, directly look at the camera so that we can take a photo. Uh, that would be really um, appreciatable. So uh, can I kindly request everyone to turn on their camera? Okay, so we have some more uh, audience who uh, still have not turned on their cameras. I, I'll be waiting one more minute. I'm a teacher, so I, I'm, I can be quite persistent about these things. <laughs> um, thank you so much to those who have turned on their camera. Okay, I think I won't take much time and I will proceed. Um, please everyone just directly look at the um, webcam uh, and uh, pause. Um, one, two, three, cheese. <laughs> Yes, you're I'm very done. invested in this, Tahia. You're very yeah, invested. I am. I am. I Interesting. Have to be. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that. Did you get a good shot? I think I did. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I'm handing over the floor to Farhan Uh, yeah. My part is done. Okay. With that, um, a Professor would love for you to stay with us because there's an interesting part that you may like. And uh, if your schedule allows, but we understand if you have to leave, but we'd love for you to stay. And with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to Arnavi. Arnavi Moinudin is in Atlanta, Georgia, and she's gonna talk about interview skills. Unmute yourself. 
Yes, of course. Hello, everybody. Um, Dr. Atomtuk, I really enjoyed your part of the presentation. It's always an honor um, for students like myself who are studying operations research to hear from renowned professors like you across the board. Um, so thank you so much for that. So the presentation I've prepared today has um, is a compilation of the experiences my peers and I have gone through during the rigorous recruitment cycle um, here at Georgia Tech. So these are just some tips and tricks um, that I think that you can use to nail your next interview. And I think the success is awaiting in your hands. To give a little bit of context um, on myself. So my name is Arnavi. I did my undergraduate here at Georgia Tech in industrial engineering, where I spent um, a a lot of time um, focusing on research, specifically in Dr. Pascal Van Hentenreich's lab, um, socially aware mobility lab, which focused on like the disgusting traffic problem Atlanta has in working on a multimodal transit system here. Um, afterwards, I moved to Capital One uh, as a data scientist, uh, data, excuse me, data analyst in anti-money laundering um, and came back to do my master's in operations research here at Georgia Tech again. Um, and I will be starting next month at Apple in iPhone product operations as a product quality manager intern. So I wanted to share a little bit about the collection of my experiences after um, interviewing. And I would say my biggest takeaway is that interviews are all about storytelling. They're essentially like a sales call where you are the product and your interviewer is the customer. And they are going to ask you all the reasons they should buy you as the product. So how can you best showcase your strengths? How are you valuable to their mission and their team? And what are the ways you can practice so that you're on autopilot during moments of crisis, during interviews, when you feel underprepared, and why you should be a good fit for those roles? So you've gotten that exciting email that you've received an in, um, interview for a role you've applied to. What are your first steps? LinkedIn is going to be your best friend. You should search for people who are currently on the team or previously in your role and reach out to them. Send a brief message describing your interests. And that could be to understand if they have any knowledge surrounding the nature of the team, the qualities that they're looking for in a candidate and the types of challenges to anticipate. It's likely they won't respond, but you've taken the initiative. And if they do respond, then one, they might be the ones that are actually interviewing you. And two, you might get insight into what the questions may be, the formatting of the interview, etc. Any kind of reaching out is helpful at this stage. Additionally, communicating with your recruiter is key. So feel free to have open communication and ask them if the interviews are going to be behavioral or technical. Again, what kind of qualities are they seeking? This format of questions you can ask to as many people as you want who are related to the role, and they'll provide a unique like outlook on what you think they think that you'll be able to um, offer to the position. Additionally, at our stage, I think one of the problems um, that we face is that we'll apply to a new role and they'll ask, for example, uh, what experience do you have in this industry? And it is not possible for us to garner that many experiences in this amount of time. It is um, crucial that you just show that you have curiosity and interest in the role, that you've researched their company, the mission, you know how you relate to um, your future goals and just show initiative on your end. The first question I've ever gotten at any stage of any interview that I've ever given is, um, tell me a little about yourself, which is a daunting question at first. But I take that as an opportunity to give a very brief resume walkthrough, usually two to three minutes, maybe three to five. But these should be high level overviews of key takeaways from your most important roles. And they should cover both hard skills and soft skills. So they should review the languages or the softwares that you use, overall projects that you worked on, um, the soft skills or professional development skills that Farhana was talking about earlier. You can chronologically work through your resume, but there's no need to experience, um, excuse me, mention all experiences. But remember that everything that is listed there is fair game. And the interviewer may ask you to delve into it at any point. One step that is crucial, but you should um, take the time and energy to take, uh, is to cater your resume to the positions that you're seeking. Some may be more data analytics focused, meaning you want to focus on your data enhancement, data pipeline building. If it's more um, communications based, 
then you want to show how you've built relationships with cross-functional teams, showcase leadership skills, how you've gathered intent on different kinds of projects. If it's more data science skilled um, focus, then you want to discuss more so on your interactions with model development teams. But it's crucial that you cater your resume towards the positions that you are seeking. You're always going to get a mix of behavioral and technical questions. And this slide is specifically focused on the behavioral questions. It is unfortunately impossible to predict the kinds of behavioral questions that you are going to get. Um, you can do as much preparation as you want and hope to God that they will ask you one type of question over the other, but you will know um, the buckets of questions that they will fall into. I like to look at my collection of experiences as a goodie bag. You only have so many experiences, as I mentioned earlier, but you want to be able to learn to adapt each of them to answer several types of questions. So you're gonna get things where people ask about the project descriptions that you have, like describe a time where you've had to collect data to implement some kind of change, or describe a time where you've used good judgment and logic and problem solving. You'll see that this question is kind of synonymous with describe a time where you've had a challenge that you've had to overcome in the workplace. You can take the same experience and mold it to answer that kind of question specifically. These may also range all the way to kind of uncomfortable but thought-provoking questions like candidate fits. So what are your biggest strengths and weaknesses? Where do you see yourself in five years? Why are you so interested in our company? The key to answering these questions is to be honest, but to showcase growth. If you, for example, in the past had a problem with joining a new team and asking enough questions, then tell your story like, once I joined Capital One, for example, I found myself too shy to um, answer, or answer X, Y, Z. I found, however, that I wasn't seeing any kind of lateral movement when I wasn't the subject matter expert of some projects. I took X, Y, Z changes um, to become the point of contact for projects going forward, and that is showcasing growth. They want to see that you are introspective and are working on self-improvement in the workplace constantly. Um, always listen for what the interview is asking. There is always some kind of subliminal messaging in terms of how the interview is guiding your question, their questions, what the role is asking from you, and make sure, again, to cater your experiences in terms of what is being sought. The key here is also to be clear and concise, but remember that contextualizing is truly key. Um, your interviewer has no understanding of the the environment in which you face your challenges. You want to be really clear in terms of how you just define your problems, discuss the challenges, review your solution and the responsibilities that you have, and to really drive home and emphasize your impact. Um, that is a few of the ways that you can tackle your behavioral questions. Technical questions, I would say, um, are the most daunting beast to conquer, what we all stress about most, but there should be comfort in the fact that it is not about um, the answer, it's all about your process. Um, of course, you will have those right or wrong technical um, screenings. So a lot of the questions that I got in our Google Forms were, how can I hone in on my um, language skills? How can I best prepare to be a strong data scientist? Uh, to pass those coding screening tests, there are a myriad of resources available now um, that range from LeetCode, which are all like Python Java-based questions, Educative.io, which are system design-based questions, um, Reddit forums, which seems like an interesting thing, but uh, so many students like ourselves document their experiences in detail, which can be so helpful for those who have um, not really had um, uh, involvement in these processes. One type of technical question that you're guaranteed to get are hypotheticals. And I would suggest that you actually have a lot of fun answering these questions. Um, again, there is no right answer when you're answering a hypothetical question. They're seeking your critical thinking abilities and they are purposely, uh, purposefully ambiguous. So they're gonna be very high level. You're gonna, add, um, but the whole point is for them to see what your thought process is. They want you to be thorough. They want you to ask clarifying questions. And at some point you may find that they're guiding you on a certain path and they're asking you a kind of question to narrow what your answer is. 
which at some times can be intimidating because you feel like, oh, I must be answering the question um, incorrectly. But it, you should kind of take that as motivation that they see potential in you and they wanna see if you can put yourself on your, that path yourself. So hypothetical questions are personally my favorite and a lot of fun to answer. Then you get into the more heavy mathematical, um, theoretical questions that relate to data science. Um, this uh, list that I've compiled is not the most comprehensive, but from the research that I've done, speaking to different hiring um, managers at companies who are looking for data scientists, this is what I've gotten from them. Uh, most FANGs or companies like Capital One, Apple, they will have data science challenges um, where you're given a data set and a problem statement. For example, you're given a series of fraud alerts or fraud statements, and they want you to predict based on a new um, testing data set. And they are not looking for, as I've said many times, the answer. They wanna see how you're exploring the data, how you're identifying the plots, whether or not you were able to build and test performance. And then they may ask you questions surrounding model diagnostics, ANOVA testing, the fundamentals of regression, machine learning, um, different decision tree based models, statistical methods. They may even ask you to explain some high level concept to a kindergartner or somebody who has never been exposed to the field of data science before to really understand your level of familiarity and um, comprehension. It's also important to note that you're aware of the relevant uses for each kind of model and like how these models are specifically built. If you're applying for data science and machine learning related roles, it's likely there will be a data engineering related component and these can relate to system design questions. System design is all um, about pipeline building, uh, modularizing different kinds of packages that you build so they can run on a timely matter and output results um, efficiently. Additionally, familiarity with pipelines such as Jenkins, CICD, EMR, and AWS clusters. I know there are students here who are just an undergrad, and these are things you'll gain familiarity with once you intern or work in the industry. So don't be intimidated by that but do do a lot of research on your own um, end to show that you have interest in the position and um, can take initiative to learn on your own. Um, and lastly, things like setting up the virtual environments, cloud-based understanding, and um, what's crucial here that'll differentiate you from other data scientists is your coding practices and familiarity with best coding practices, meaning writing not only efficient code, but well commented and well documented code. As you enter industry, you'll experience um, times where a project hasn't been touched in months, needs to be revitalized, there are no points in contact that are available, and you want to show that you've um, learned from those mishaps and um, will prevent them from anybody else experiencing that with your work in the future as well. So uh, about 10 minutes before your interview ends, um, the interviewer will ask you, do you have any questions for me? Um, this is your time to show off all the curiosity, the research that you've done. Make sure to look deeply into the company, their core values, their mission. And I think one um, rookie mistake that a lot of people make is to uh, have a list of questions. I know I've personally done this before and just fly through them. Uh, you're, you're so stressed from the interview. You don't even really know what they're saying and digesting it properly. Um, you have a list you wanna show you've done a lot of research. They're not impressed by that. What you wanna do is treat each question as a conversation starter. This can relate to technicalities of the models that they deployed or past challenges for candidates joining the role, the nature of the team, professional development of the interviewer, um, whether there are opportunities for leadership and mentorship, and make sure to like play off of those conversations as well. Um, and let there be a flow, then move on to your next question when you think is appropriate. There are some soft skills that I want you to remember as you go into any of these uh, interviews. It's very intimidating. You can get this kind of imposter syndrome that you're not qualified in some kind of way, but know that if you've gotten the interview that you're there for a reason. They've seen your resume, they see that you have the chops to do it. Now it's your time to prove them right. So be confident, rehearse so that you're on autopilot during moments of crisis. Um, you never want your brain to fry when someone's asking you a question. But if you do, take a second to take a deep breath, um, reorient yourself, 
And make sure that as you're discussing your experiences that you're emphasizing these soft skills. So that means opportunities for leadership, communication, problem solving, technical writing, um, relationship building is very important. Flexibility, um, ability to reprioritize ta tasks in times of um, pressure and conflict. So uh, lastly is that interviewers are all sub subjective. So be personable, have fun with it, enjoy the conversation, never, um, the like shy away from having a conversation about something fun that you notice about the interviewer. And know that you um, are seeking out whether or not they are a good fit for you as much as they are with you. After the interview, make sure to write down all the questions that you have. It's really helpful to reflect on them, um, specifically if you think you could have done better, but also for others as you help them alongside their journey. Understand that every single experience has an invaluable takeaway, regardless of the outcome. You learn the most from your worst experiences when you think of every possible answer you could have come up with. And that to me is, is um, just, as I've said, invaluable. Uh, at times, if you find appropriate, then email the interviewer thanking them and note what you've gathered about the role and how it relates specifically to your experience. Um, this may not always be necessary. It's personal preference from candidate to candidate. Um, there's a fine line in being overzealous and being enthused about the role um, and wanting to join. Make sure to follow up if you um, haven't heard back in a timely manner. And otherwise, I will take some questions now. Thank you so much, Arnavi. It was a great uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I actually had a question, so I just jumped in. Um, can you say a little bit more about your own personal um, experience, about your internship at Apple, something that just like struck you like that? Okay, this is something that I've never had before. And how did you tackle that? Like, you know, there's always something random happening, right? And you just said, like, you have to be confident. So um, can you say a few words about that? Like if something like that happened or not, and if it did, and how did you tackle it? In terms of my interview experiences personally? Yeah, I think every interview I've ever had um, that they ask an unexpected question that'll kind of uh, make you unstable for a moment. And all you have to do is take a moment to yourself to think logically through that kind of problem. Specifically, the technical questions that you might get may be full of like ambiguous jargon trying to throw you off. Start small. So if they say, for example, you have 1.5 billion iPhones, you want to uh, analyze some element of, their, of, of, of a product that's gone wrong or like the software that is... Um, not working in some kind of way. How do you collect the sample data? You need to ask what you know from how you've designed and analyzed past experiments or field studies. Draw on your experiences and be able to have that kind of conversation. And as I said earlier, clarifying questions are what they're looking for. So they want you to reduce this big grandiose statement that they've said to something that is more chewable, manageable. If that is able to answer your question properly. Thank you so much, thank you. Hello, Arnavi. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I really got to learn a lot. Um, so um, we have some questions from our registered participants for you. And I would like to start one by one, if you're okay with it. Yes, of course. Okay. So um, congratulations, first of all, for your internship at Apple. And um, I would like to start of by calling you as a very successful uh, student who graduated from Georgia Tech. And with that, my first question is, what do you think was the key to your success? Do you think that a uh, master's at Georgia Tech prepared you well enough for the interviews? If you had to change one thing of your journey to success, what would it be? Yes. Um, can you repeat the first question and then the second? Yeah. What do you think was the key to your success? Um, 
So I think uh, as, as you've heard, Farhana has, um, and, and my parents in my life have always made, wanted me to like make sure that all opportunities are open for me. Um, and that has been something I've kept in the back of my mind as I moved through high school and college, is that if I wanted to pursue higher education, master's, PhD, or if I wanted to go into industry, I wanted um, to make sure I had a network available and a path to do both. So during my undergraduate career, um, I spent time as a teaching assistant. I'm a teaching assistant now, but I also am well connected to the professors that I'm very interested in and did a lot of research. Um, that means that if I'm interested in pursuing my PhD at some point, that I would have the option to do so. But I also, uh, in my time at Capital One, made sure to connect with hiring managers and directors in data science positions um, so that if I were able to come back to Capital One as a data scientist, I would be best prepared. And I think the master's program has been specifically crucial because my biggest takeaway from undergrad was um, industrial engineering is such an interesting but broad topic that I barely touched everything that I was so interested in. So um, master's gave me the opportunity to delve into them technically. Um, and I found when I was interviewing this semester that all the coursework was somehow related to the positions that I was interviewing for, which was crucial to me. Um, if I could change anything about my um, undergraduate or master's career, I think everything has happened for a reason. I, I did my best and that's all you can do when you know as much as you do at that age. So that would be my answer for you. Thank you so much. I think uh, everyone who's listening to uh, listening to you right now, and including me, <clears throat> I think the right word uh, here would be the mindset that you have, uh, and that's what every undergraduate student should have uh, to pursue any career or any academic field, and especially data science. Uh, with that, uh, my next question would be um, about uh, this is something. Uh, this question actually came from. A university level student, but this is something that I also get asked by my students, and they are only high school students. Uh, and that is, uh, what what is the easy way to learn programming, or uh, what is the easy way to learn the basics of data science, and what motivated you to learn programming? Yes. Okay. So. Unfortunately, the answer I have for that question is generic and what everybody has been saying nowadays, but there are um, so many options online for boot camps and courses to learn the basics of coding and machine learning, which are like the foundations of data science, as well as um, SQL to get familiar with data analytics, which is another crucial component of data science. And those are the best ways to get involved. Um, if you're in a university and you have um, a, are involved in a major that is not related to data science specifically, then take courses in coding and machine learning, and those will be your biggest foundations. Again, a weird suggestion is these Reddit forums. There are so many uh, resources online of people who have already gone through these experiences and are in their free time just spreading this information. I always say that Stack Overflow is a modern day form of true altruism because I don't know who takes the time to, to just make these resources on their own. Um, and I think you had a second uh, component to your question. Um, I think you have pretty much covered what I asked, yeah. Okay, so uh, moving on to my next question, that would be um, as a graduate student in a thesis based masters, uh, from when should we begin preparing for jobs? And uh, which soft skills should we focus on after, uh, apart from the uh, tech skills? Yes, so I'm not as familiar with the timeline of a thesis-based master's, but you should always start looking the semester before you are um, intend to work. That is the beginning of the semester before you intend to work to start reaching out to students you may know in the roles that you're interested in, um, start applying, uh, prepare your resume and be ready. In terms of a specific timeline, say you are looking to start work in August, then I would suggest within January to March, you have your resume kind of 
um, good to go. Uh, March to May, you reach out to recruiters, apply to jobs, and then May to June, July, spend interviewing to start in August, September-ish. And that's a, a longer time frame. Um, for interns in undergrad and graduate school, then the turnaround time is usually from, uh, I would say, August, September, by October, you basically know for a January internship. Thank you so much for the very precise answer. Now you have mentioned uh, earlier on that uh, we have so many resources available online or so many uh, mediums through which we can learn about data science and programming if one wants to. So uh, what resources did you use to increase your proficiency in the languages necessary to become a data science? Yes, um, so as I was showing, uh, LeetCode is a great way to prepare for data science interviews. Um, the students, uh, like my classmates and peers that I know who are really gung-ho on their um, data science preparation, spend about two to three months, if not more, prepping weekly with lead code problems. Because um, as one of my mentors at Capital One told me, uh, so many of these applicants are more than qualified to be successful at, uh, in these data science roles. However, they get cut in the initial coding screening because a lot of people just don't prepare in that way. So it is very crucial that if you are interested in these technical roles, that you um, pass that coding screening and can do so with educative.io, lead code, again, multiple other platforms to do so. What I personally did was um, I uh, had a lot of experiences um, in undergrad and working that kept me coding throughout school. So I really never had a lapse in that practice, um, which was very helpful. And I also had a lot of experience from database manipulation and cleansing um, all the way to like app development at some point as a graduate research assistant. Um, and then when I went to Capital One, uh, data enhancement pipelines. So uh, modularizing all these Python packages that we built. Um, so this relates kind of to my first question on keys to success during your undergrad is like diversify your experiences. If you understand what you want to pursue, then have the options in, uh, open so that you can fall into any kind of field. Um, uh, the professor earlier was telling us about how versatile uh, industrial engineering is, and that is really so true uh, because it gives you the foundations for coding, operations research, optimization, machine learning, data science, software engineering, and um, everyone knows that those are the hottest topics right now and will continue to be as we move forward. Thank you so much, RDP. This was really helpful. I'm sure this was helpful for the audience present here today. And with that note, uh, we are done with our Q&A session. Um, thank you so much once again. And I would like to hand over the floor to uh, Tanzi. Thank you. Thank you, Tahia. Thank you, Arnavi. Thank you, everybody. So um, I would like to share something because I have a few announcements to make. Uh, so this is our first virtual meetup uh, of the Harville data community. So my first announcement would be, I would like to share my screen. Of 2023, this is not our Of first. 2023, yeah. 2023 first? Yeah. Okay, so of 2023 first, in that case, I don't have to uh, share my screen. Um, just a second. So our first announcement would be uh, we are um, uh, just a second. So for 2023, we have huge plans and um, we would like to award. We would like to award like we have two awards here. So first of all, we would like for all of you to reach out to your peers and your friends. So we are going to have an award for the person with the most outreach in the end of the year. And the another award would be for the person with the most attendance in our community virtual meetups. So you just like take a note whenever you get a registration link. So we will also have 
uh, a tab asked uh, a tab added to the form that where did you hear it uh, hear about uh, the meeting and you can also put down the name so that's how we're gonna keep a track of the outreach um uh, uh, registrations and yes, these two stuff: outreach and attendance. So please spread the word. Let everybody know uh, about our community meetup, our virtual meetup. So we are really looking forward to it. And as you just the people, the attendees who are present now, you just heard uh, Dr. Atamturk. You also heard uh Arnovi, and I'm pretty much sure that you have learned something new that you haven't heard before and that's why we organized this meet these meetups so please do that and just these awards are just to boost our community outreach so in that case so my other announcement would be I'm not sure about that if you have heard this or seen this so we're also starting a naming contest for our data science and AI program. So we could have come up with the name on our own, but we would like to involve and engage the audience, the students, the participants more into this thing. So I'm going to post a link in this chat for everybody. So it's a Google Doc form. You can, all you need to do is just go through it and uh, come up with a great and creative name. All the rules are mentioned in that form. Only one name is allowed for one person. I will just send it to the chat now. There you go. You can just click it and see if you can view the form. The rules and uh, the submission deadline, everything is mentioned there. And there's also a very funny thing that Farhana uh, told us to do. The whole, you, you can just read the form and you can go through it and then you will see, yes. Um, so that is one thing. And I'm going to share another link for you because last time we uh, heard that somebody wanted to have a Discord server for the community. So. We were using this, the Discord server different. We had two Discord servers for the Datathon 2022 and 2021. But this time we have also created a Discord server for the community. So it's a community server. I am going to post the link here again. It's another one. So please join the Discord server. This link, just one thing, remember this link is valid for seven days only. I generated this link just today, so you will be able to join it for one week. So just get in there, read the rules, and um, yeah, we can keep in touch by this. Like we can just, you can always ask questions to Farhana or to me or Arnavi, she's also Arnavi, please join the Discord server. You can also ask her directly or in the general channel. We also have a channel called Nerd Memes. It's supposed to be a bit like, you know, professional. And also at the same time, we're allowed to have some fun about this because we are more or less nerds. So yeah, that there you go here. And I think I am done with the announcements. Uh, do you have any questions? Um, you can just uh, turn on your microphone and just ask it. Do you have any questions regarding the announcements or the Discord link and the server or anything? I also wanted to quickly say that please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email me if you have any follow-up questions. A lot of the topics that I covered, you could spend hours on each. So um, I'm also going to post the LinkedIn links in this chat for Arnovi and also for uh, Professor Atemtor. So if it's okay for you, I didn't, uh, sorry, Professor Atemtor, I didn't even ask you. <laughs> is it okay? Cool. <laughs> I do have a question for the professor. Um, is it okay for us to advertise or not advertise put on our social media that we encourage them to apply to the Berkeley analytics program of course, of course. okay perfect and um Tanzim could you make sure we add that to the newsletter as well 
And also, please keep an eye for our newsletter. It's coming up um, yeah. within a few days. Minute. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think oh, we have... that's 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 from my part. We took I think a, a little bit longer than five minutes because we started ten minutes later. <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Akinpork. I was uh, really, uh, was really excited about this uh, session. And Onobi, thank you so much. It was uh, I'm in the, I'm already an industry expert, but I also had my fair share of interviewing, and I wish that I had someone like you telling me at that time. Uh, what am I to expect? So please, any students or uh, beginners or like uh, anyone, please. Uh, this is a this was really great. And uh, yes, Farhana, thank you so much. You are amazing as always. And thank you all of my her wheel colleagues because you have no idea what kind of work was going on behind this behind camera. It yeah, I'm just so glad that you like so, it. I just wanted to add, sorry, Tanzim, sorry to cut you off. I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted to add something for Professor Atom Turk and the, uh, whoever is left here from the community is that we wanted to build this program for the students to gather up from all over the world. Where And we got about 58 registration this time. So we we are consistently getting over 50 unique res registrations at every meeting. And that's something that if that trend continues, it's a great success because we target for about 25. And with that registration, it means that there is a lot of interest and we usually send out the recorded events. And this time we'll do the same. So they learn a lot. And what I wanted to wanted to happen was that that cultural sensitivity for each other and to learn from each other what goes on in their unique environments so um, that is one of the major goals and also the you know aside from the knowledge and experiences that we're sharing here so it's going to be hopefully with your help with all of our colleagues at Georgia Tech and USC and Clark Atlanta will make um, Make this a very successful uh, gathering. Great. Well, I really enjoyed uh, participating. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this. This is a really very um, um, the unique platform. Um, really, I mean, I, I'm I'm not aware of sort of any other organization with this this type of a reach that you have. Appreciate you a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay, with that, we can call it a day. Thank you so much for your okay. patience, Atiyah, Shah, and Smart Biz.